Hi, welcome back. In this video, what I want to do is, and, and this of course is before we really get into unsaturated fats, we're still in, in saturated fats. What I want to do is I want to learn a little bit about propionyl CoA and, and, and how it fits into the whole picture. So what I've drawn here is I've drawn something called pentanoyl CoA. And pentanoyl CoA is just a five carbon fatty acid. So you could imagine this could have come, you know, let's say it came from a fatty acid that was 15 carbons. And it would have gone from 15 to 13 to 11 to 9 to 7 down to this. And now what we're going to do is we're going to run it through beta oxidation. And of course, that's four steps, right? So beta oxidation, not drawing the enzymes. And this is going to go through beta oxidation, and we're going to end up with this. We're going to end up with propionyl CoA. And propionyl CoA cannot undergo beta oxidation, right? Beta oxidation specifically produces acetyl CoA. So if I was to do a beta oxidation there, I'd be left with just one carbon, right? But I have, so this is why you have to have an even number of carbons, right? Because you're ultimately producing acetyl CoA, and acetyl CoA is two carbons. So the number of carbons to do the normal beta oxidation pathway the whole way have to be multiples of two. Propionyl CoA has a different pathway that it undergoes. And um, the pathway essentially is going to ultimately end up at succinyl CoA, which will go into the TCA cycle. But um, propionyl CoA has, a, we have a way to deal with it, and it's going to go something like this. And the enzyme that catalyzes this reaction is called propionyl CoA, try to squeeze it in here, carboxylase. Propionyl CoA carboxylase. Now, one thing about carboxylases that is important to understand is carboxylases a lot of times. They don't, the, the carboxyl group doesn't come from where you think it would come from. If, if I told you that, oh, we have a carboxylase, you might think it comes from CO2. And in fact, there are some carboxylases that use CO2. Um, ribulose 1,5, or yeah, ribulose 1,5 bisphosphate carboxylase oxygenase, Rubisco, the plant enzyme does use CO2. And there are a lot of enzymes that do use carbon dioxide as the carboxyl donor. But this is a specific type of carboxylase that uses bicarbonate, HCO3 minus, and it also is going to burn an ATP. Okay, it's going to burn an ATP. And out of it, you're going to get an ADP and a phosphate. ADP and phosphate. And one also thing worth mentioning about this enzyme is a lot of times when you have carboxylases that use bicarbonate, they're going to be biotin-dependent enzymes, and I don't have space to write it there. But whenever you have bicarbonate as the carboxyl donor, a lot of times they're biotin-dependent enzymes. Okay, so this is propionyl CoA carboxylase, and what we're going to generate is we're going to generate something that looks like this. We're going to generate this. And this molecule has a special name, and, the, and what I want you to see is that it is a D isomer of methyl, methyl malonyl CoA. And there are two methyl malonyls. There is a D isomer and an L isomer. And recall that the D isomer and L isomer are essentially just sort of an offshoot of the RS stereochemistry. Um, they don't necessarily correspond to a specific R or S, but notice that we do have a chiral center. Here's our chiral center right there, and um, you know I could I could I could draw it with a dash or a wedge. I'm not going to do it. I'm just going to just spe simply specify that this is the D isomer. This is the D isomer of methyl malonyl CoA, right? Well, there's an enzyme that's going to interconvert, and it's an equilibrium reaction. So it's not necessarily going to be one or the other. It just depends on what we load the body up with. It's just a shot liaise principle, right? And this enzyme is called methyl malonyl coa epimerase. Epimerase. 
And essentially what this is, it's an isomerase. And what it's going to do, the net effect, is it's going to reverse the stereochemistry at this carbon. At this carbon, it's going to reverse the stereochemistry. So I'm going to try to draw it so you can understand it. It's going to reverse the stereochemistry. Let's see if I can test my artistic skills. There, reverses the stereochemistry. So what do we have? D, in, in this case, we had D-methylmalonyl-CoA. Now we have what? We have l methyl malonyl coa and so this is an equilibrium reaction so let's say i am intaking a lot of propionyl coa of course you would intake it generally in the form of propionyl coa it's going to get catabolized to propionyl coa but what you're going to end up doing is you're going to load the body up with methyl, a, a d methyl malonyl coa and so by Le Chatelier's principle, if I stress the system on one side, it's going to shift to the other to relieve the stress. So if I'm loading the body up with D-methylmalonyl-CoA, you're going to end up producing a lot of L-methylmalonyl-CoA, right? And so ultimately, if I have a lot of propionyl-CoA, you're ultimately going to get a lot of L-methylmalonyl-CoA. And then I also have another equilibrium reaction. And this is a very special enzyme, and I want to, I want to just... May help you understand this is a very special enzyme. This is called methyl malonyl, kind of messy, methyl malonyl CoA mutase. Methyl malonyl CoA mutase. And the important thing about this enzyme is it has a very special cofactor, and the cofactor is vitamin B12. And B12 is, is a cofactor that can act as a methyl group donor. And it turns out that this mutase is a special kind of mutase because essentially this methyl group right here is going to end up between this methyl group and this carboxyl group. And the ultimate methyl group donor is going to be the B12, vitamin B12. And actually what's interesting about B12 is it's the largest well, it's the largest micromolecule. There are micromolecules and macromolecules. Macro is like the is like DNA and protein. I mean, those are just massive. But the as far as I know, the, the the largest you can think of it like the largest small molecule. The largest micromolecule is vitamin B12. If you were to Google it, like in Wikipedia, it is utterly massive. I don't. I mean, I, it's the one structure I don't even have memorized. It's just an utterly huge structure, and it turns out that 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 is only used by two enzymes in the body, in the humans at least. It's used by this enzyme, methylmalonyl-CoA mutase. It's also used by methionine synthase, um, which is in the, um, the SAM cycle, which we'll do a lot later, much later, when we do amino acid catabolism. But this is one of the two enzymes that uses it. And essentially that methyl group is going to end up between... Um, the carbon it's attached to and the carboxyl group and so you can imagine what we're going to generate and we're going to generate something like this and i'll do it in a bold color we are going to generate this and you might recognize this molecule and you'd be right this is succinyl s coa succinyl coa and so that's going to go into the tca cycle and actually i might just go ahead and quiz you what is the name of the ends, the initial enzyme in the TCA cycle that consumes it? And so I'll give you a minute. You can pause the video and see if you can figure it out. And it turns out that the enzyme is called succinyl CoA synthetase, right? It's a synthetase because it requires a nucleoside triphosphate, right? Or a nucleotide triphosphate. Um, remember that succinyl CoA synthetase can also be referred to as succinate CoA ligase. Recall that synthetases are ligases that require a nucleotide triphosphate, right? But ultimately, notice we, we turn propionyl CoA into succinyl CoA. And it, it's a very short pathway, but it's necessary, right? If I have an odd numbered fatty acid, I'm going to generate propionyl CoA. And I need, a, I need a way to catabolize it, but this time it goes into the TCA cycle. And in fact, there are actually other pathways 
that aren't um, necessarily, you know, normal saturated fatty acids that produce propionyl CoA. In fact, there is another pathway. Um, it, well, it, well, in general, there, there are a lot of pathways that generate propionyl CoA. In fact, one of them that generates it is a pathway called alpha oxidation. Alpha, let me write that. Another pathway that catabolizes it, or excuse me, that produces um, propionyl CoA is alpha oxidation. And note that that is a different pathway than beta oxidation. Beta oxidation oxidizes the beta carbon. So if I was to have my fatty acid here, right? In beta oxidation, it'd be oxidizing that carbon, right? Alpha oxidation is different. Alpha oxidation oxidizes this carbon. And the reason it does that is usually because you have all sorts of um, carbon groups sticking out that makes it a very unusual um, basically there, there's carbon chains sticking out so that normal beta oxidation cannot occur but there are other pathways that produce propionyl CoA in fact another pathway that produces it is bile salt synthesis in the synthesis of colloidal CoA um, propionyl CoA is, is produced so there are other pathways that produce propionyl CoA not just odd numbered fatty acids so there is quite a lot of it produced in your body and so the way you deal with it is this you carboxylate it with bicarbonate in an ATP dependent process and then you epimerize it you isomerize this the stereogenic carbon and then you mutate it you you form succinyl CoA and that gets dumped into the TCA cycle and and then you end up producing energy well if you recall let's see we're gonna generate succinate right succinate let's think about what succinate's gonna do right all the way up to citrate Right, the beginning of the TCA cycle. Well, succinate is going to get consumed by succinate dehydrogenase. That's going to produce an FADH2. Right, and then you have uh, that generates fumarate. Then you have fumarate hydratase. Right, and then that generates malate. And then you have malate dehydrogenase that generates an NADH. And then of course you have um, citrate synthase. Right, so ultimately when you put succinyl CoA into there and actually I should also mention that in succinyl coenzyme coenzyme excuse me succinyl coenzyme synthetase you generate a G, GTP right so when you put this into the TCA cycle you you bypass the initial oxidations that generate two NADHs but you end up generating a GTP an FADH2 and an NADH so in a sense propionyl CoA actually um, generates more energy than a one round of beta oxidation right because in one round of beta oxidation we generate FADH2 and NADH but in propionyl CoA entry into the into the um, TCA cycle we end up with a GTP coming out of it and actually I guess you could actually consider it nulled because we had to burn an ATP um, carboxylating it but I get, well I guess you could say it's about the same it's about the same energy um, as one round of beta oxidation but ultimately um, we have a way to deal with odd number fatty acids in other videos we'll actually look at alpha oxidation and there's actually another oxidation called omega oxidation that we'll look at um, but for now what we're going to do is we're going to look at unsaturated fatty acid catabolism as we'll find they actually produce less energy than saturated fats so I hope this video helped see you in the next video